Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Of course, here with Bill. About to fire through 22 questions. Uh, but here, Bill, first things first, how are you? I'm good. There better be good questions. We're not answering dumb questions, Jason. <laughs> like, hey, time is money. Of, I'm busy. A Let's go. Ones. A lot of stuff. Recent news, of course. Um, you know, I know there's some terrible shootings um, happening in the U.S. and a lot of news coverage. But those made its way into the questions, as well as a bunch of other stuff. But without further ado, I guess let's let's dive in. Yeah. So, uh, Sorry about the hat. The COVID hair is still a thing. And I'm <laughs> running. I don't have time today. So uh we're we're going a little casual today ah, no worries you're rock, rocking the company branded hat so exactly here let, let's dive into it in no order so first one uh, i've got a question how many security robots can the company deploy in a month oh uh that's a great question because usually it's asked a different way uh, a lot of investors typically ask like how many can you build and that's typically the wrong question uh the wrong question because the bottleneck that the investor is looking for is not the production side of things. It's actually the deployment process. Um, like as much as I would want to put these machines in a crate, ship it and tell the client, like press go and you're done. Um, that's one of the really difficult things to, uh, do. And so, uh, today it typically takes depending on how complex the location is and how responsive the client is, because the client does need to be involved. Um, we're typically maybe three to five days on site at one location. Um, and then three to five days off site, kind of virtual debugging and everything else. And not everything's sequential. So you can't add up all the days on top of each other. So we're typically deploying multiple machines at the same time. Uh, we've also now, because we've have, I don't, don't quote me here, nearly a $2 million backlog so somewhere one point something, um, and some supply chain issues, we have some bumpiness in the deployment process. So we've gone a little old school. We did this a long time ago and I'm going to do it uh, again, which is a little, uh, a little bit of a merry-go-round approach which is how do you overlay the deployment process of dealing with the client's needs the electrical at the facility, the deployment of the docking station, the mapping of the location, and then the actual robot and the training. All those don't have to be all sequential. So now what we're doing is like, okay, I'll put a bunch of docking stations out while someone else is mapping, sending a different robot, not the client's robot, for us to do the setup. And then when the actual robot shows up, like just kind of really project managing it, uh, so that we can get a lot more out the door. Um, so we're uh, we're cooking. I, I think this next uh, month or two, we should hopefully be making a big dent, I'll say, in the backlog. I, I'll uh, we still have some supply chain stuff we need to deal with, but uh, things are looking up. Super excited. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, there you go. We started off hot. Cool. All right. Here, a uh, second question again in, in no order. Um, does the company think major events... Uh, unfortunately, like school shootings help business? I'll answer it two different ways. I think one of the reasons why people are long on night scope and why I'm willing to, you know, I've spent nearly a decade on this and prepare to spend another two or three to force the, the win is just think of it. A lot of investors always worry about is the market for something going to fizzle? NFTs in or out? Uh, the metaverse in or out, uh, flip phones coming back, no idea. Like what's hot, what's not, whatever. Like the market for crime, if you want to look at it that way, is never going away, right? So I think that gives a lot of confidence to investors. Like, okay, if you have the solution, they're willing to buy it. You don't have market risk. Like it's not like everyone's going to behave tomorrow morning, right? Um, so that's kind of one way to think about it. I think the other is, I think since Sandy Hook, there's been 3,500 mass shootings. Like, yes, they hit the headlines and then they disappear. They hit the headlines and then they disappear. I, I don't think we think about it that way. It's like we have the, the duty, honor, and privilege to wake up every morning in Silicon Valley. And actually now in 15 states, we've got teammates all across the country um, to work on the actual problem, uh, regardless of what awful things are happening or what noise is in the system. We just need to focus on, on the issues 
um, and we've now proven that technology works and you know we're, we're making some progress it does bring more attention to what we're doing you might imagine my inbox recently has changed uh, you know what are you doing how can you go faster how can I help um, which is is good but you know good for business I look at it a different way um, if night scope wins everyone wins if the criminals and terrorists win no one wins right fair enough no good answer um yeah like, like you touched on too your inbox probably is seeing a slight change recently um uh, but here kind of moving on uh is, what's night scope doing internationally outside of the u.s zero okay any expansion to that to that answer or just it's it's not a popular answer um our mission is to secure the United States of America. Right before the public listing, we had 35,000 investors, and that's the commitment that we made. We take that very seriously, so that's the first point. Second point, 95% of startups fail, and part of it is the CEO is not willing to politely say no when everyone has someone has a new good idea. Uh, third, I've worked on four continents personally. I know what it takes. I can say with a straight face, you are nearing a hundred percent probability of a BTE or a business terminating event. It would be different if it was software only. It is not. Um, you have psychological societal impacts. There's insurance. There's audits for subsidiaries to think about. There's import export tariff issues. Some stuff you got ITAR stuff that you may not be able to ship out. You got transfer pricing. I mean, there's all kinds of things that looks really cool in a PowerPoint. Like we're going to go to Argentina or we're going to go to South Africa. I'm like, okay, physically do it. And that's a whole other game. I work for the shareholders and I need to protect their long-term interests, even though they might get upset with me from time to time for, you know, politely saying no. Yeah. No, and it makes sense. Uh, I think that's a great answer. You gave a lot of good points. Um, cool. So next question, I've got, how would these security robots be of use in a situation where there are many loud and disorderly folks? For example, a sports team losing and everyone being mad after that leads to a riot. Um, less so. I mean, these are intended to do the monotonous, computationally heavy work um, and not for crowd control, right? This is why we always say it's software plus hardware plus humans. You, you need the, these are tools. Um, the other thing, you know, we have pre-COVID, we had a good amount of experience with some stadiums and that sort of thing. Um, you'd be surprised the actual security risk, in my opinion, um, in some cases is when the venue is empty. It, it's not, you know, when it, it's, it's crowded and, you know, there's a physical strong presence of law enforcement or, uh, security, um, not, not typically used, uh, in that case and not, not where we spend our, our time. Our time is spent on, you know, commercial real estate, apartment complexes, um, corporate campuses, hospitals, airports, rail, uh, and, and the like. Um, th there are some, you know, opportunities that, you know, we're, we're working with some, you know, prospective clients, but not, not the, that's not kind of the, the standard. What are the current known limitations of the security robots that would still require a human to arrive on the scene? Um, again, these are tools. They are not one-for-one -one replacement of a human. Um, I think part of the problem is, uh, I always say this, Hollywood has done us a service and disservice uh, with all the crazy sci-fi movies and streaming episodes of whatever madness that the robot did. Um, you, would, you wouldn't ask me that question if it was a law enforcement vehicle or police motorcycle, right? You, would, you wouldn't say, what would this do if there wasn't a human there? It'd be a kind of an odd question. It's a tool. It's, it's an inanimate object. It happens to do some things. It does, it does them really well, but it needs a human to actually. So you want to think of the robots as giving the officers and guards uh, eyes, ears, and voice on the ground for them to be in multiple locations at the same time. Um, and then when enforcement needs to happen, 
or decision needs to be made, that's what the human does. These are, again, tools, not a kind of one-for-one -one replacement. They're not doing anything offensive uh, or the like. Um, in 17 states, I think it's, I think it's around that. Uh, so it's illegal for a security guard to put their hand on you. Uh, they are to um, observe and report only. And that's basically what the, what the, the robots do. Got it. Yeah. He had a uh, part two question was, is a response time with a human an issue in any way? It's always an issue. I, I, that's part of the problem. I mean, if we want to talk about the school shootings, you know, in some cases, uh, and this is a, on average or generality, not any specific location, you know, it used to be that typically it won't be maybe six minutes until 911 gets called. Six minutes. I mean, six minutes in that situation, one is an eternity. Two, um, when the phone call is made, what does the 911, what does 911 dispatch know? I've got a timestamp, I've got a shooting, shots fired, and um, I have maybe an address. Nothing else, completely blind. You have no idea how many suspects on premise. You don't know what door they went in. You don't know what floor they're on. You don't know how many, I mean, you don't know anything. And you're supposed to go in blind and go, you know, quell the situation. Like, yeah, response time is a problem. It's not just the time, it's the information provided. You know, in the future, what, what we would like to do is have the machines be able to not be waiting six minutes to sound the alarm, try six seconds. And then, oh, by the way, here's all the historical information associated with what just happened. And here's all the live footage. Now go, right? Yep. And again, it comes back to providing profound superhuman capabilities to the humans so they can actually do their jobs. And this is no different than providing a soldier in a theater of war unbelievable capabilities. We just happen to leave the 2 million people on our own soil that are guards and officers behind. And that's it's not okay. And that's the injustice that we're trying to fix. In terms of privacy, where is the database or facial recognition being held? And is it being shared with any other corporations? Uh, it's private. You're invading my privacy by just asking that question. So I'm highly offended. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, so I think the way we've fixed this uh, and cured it for both our clients and the public and the media is just legally and contractually make it super easy. The data that the machine generates are crudely speaking in two forms. One is the machine data, meaning the health of the batteries, how many times the motors have turned, whatever it might be, charging status. All that kind of technical stuff is owned by Nightscope. All the security data for that particular location, facial recognition, bolos for license plates, signals, you know, footage and everything that is literally and legally owned by the client, not by us. So no one can come over here and say, well, Nightscope's gathering 90 terabytes of data at every single location and is doing big brother police, whatever science fiction thing people want to go and throw out. Um, obviously we'll comply with and support um, existing laws and regulations and any subpoenas and the like to, to help thwart crime and, and criminals, but, and terrorists, uh, but the data is owned by, by our clients. The focus currently is on adoption. Um, when would the company be comfortable switching the goal from adoption to revenue based on what is the unit number that Nightscope has in mind? The question is, so right now, get as many robots out is what their general understanding of the goal is. When will that change from, okay, we don't need that much more adoption. Let's now turn it into be revenue and really profit generating. We're doing that today. We don't, I don't agree with the premise of the question. Okay. Uh, we're trying to get as many robots out and generate the revenue and associated per unit profit that goes with them. That that's not two different assignments. Okay. Perfect. Uh, leading to the next question, which kind of aligned with what you're saying, 
Um, so they have here at $8 an hour for the service for their customers. What is the current cost of each unit if the company is able to chat? And what is the general percentage of profit in a one-year lease? On our investor relations uh, website, there is the investor deck. Uh, and on there is a slide uh, that maybe we can throw up on the, on the yep. video a little bit later that has the per unit economics kind of on average uh, how much money comes in over five years from a revenue standpoint, let's say it's 50, 60, $70,000, uh, how much money to build a machine, 50, $60,000. Uh, and then maybe, you know, 10, $12,000 a year that goes out to support, uh, all the maintenance service upgrades, uh, telecom, whatever other stuff. So crudely speaking, you're probably looking at, you know, more than several hundred thousand dollars of top line revenue for the period over five years. Um, and then the margins over that period per machine is, you know, 50, 55, 60, 65%. Um, so said differently, you've got luxury automotive per unit economics, like I like to say, basically buying a new Tesla every year, but the margins look more like a software as a service. Um, and again, just go to nightscope.com slash investors. Uh, that'll take you to our investor relations page. Uh, if you go click on presentations, I think, uh, the deck is there. There's one slide that actually kind of shows that, uh, how big is an issue around terrain terrain? Um, I, I think there's two, at least two answers. Um, so the first answer is today we're pretty much, um, operating on ADA compliant areas slash parking lots uh, type of thing. And, you know, up and down an eight story parking structure uh, and the like. Uh, the new fifth generation machine we're gonna release later uh, this year, will be able to handle slightly more um, difficult terrain. I mean, slightly. So the pesky stupid parking lot speed bumps are kind of uh, a pain in the butt. Some clients don't have the budget or don't believe in asphalt or re <laughs> taking care of their places. So you're kind of running around all over the place. Um, so that's one answer. The second answer um, is we, we are working on and planning on uh, the, the K7 coming out in the future. And that's intended to handle slightly more difficult terrain. So gravel, dirt, sand, not off-roading, but you know, uh, stuff where a kind of normal K5 won't be able to patrol. Um, I think long-term, we need, if you're serious about the mission, like we want to secure the United States of America, you can't have terrain be an obstacle. Criminals and terrorists are pretty much everywhere. If you don't believe me, go to the FBI crime clock and you can see every few seconds some horrifying property crime or violent crime occurs. Um, we need to kind of be everywhere. Um, so you imagine a portfolio of products that can handle every terrain or situation or circumstance, both outdoors and indoors. Yeah, no, makes sense. They were, uh, you kind of already answered it. They said, what, what's the adoption looking like for where there's places that have snow and ice? And you kind of said- uh, you, we, you know, we have, you know, we have clients in, you know, Rhode Island and Kentucky and uh, been through a Minnesota polar vortex. <laughs> um, we, we've been through it. We, uh, don't quote me here. I think it's six summers and six winters. So we've, we've, we've gone through all that, uh, stuff. So we have a lot of, um, lessons learned, <laughs> um, but, uh, we've, we've operated now, Jason, over a million and a half hours. So we, we've kind of, uh, learned a thing or two, cause, uh, we've seen a thing or two. <laughs> Got it. Oh, look, good answer. Uh, so it says here, just a funny question haven't dove into the company too much, but what stops someone from putting a garbage bag over the robot or like shooting it with a paintball gun? Um, you can do that to a, you know, police motorcycle. You can do that to a law enforcement vehicle. You can do that to a camera, a gate or a fence. Again, it's back to the, because it's a robot, all of a sudden the game is different. Um, you can go ahead and do that. Um, I'd suggest you go to, there's a blog on our, uh, on our site called uh, Cuffed and Stuffed. Uh, typically, uh, messing around with the robot is in all 50 states likely a felony. Uh, and we likely have all the uh, evidence to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, we have and we will uh, continue to do so. I think we've today put about at least a half a dozen people behind bars. 
uh, one district attorney came back to us like, I've never been in a case with this amount of evidence. <laughs> and we had three felony convictions. So, you know, like most people realize over the last hundred years, like maybe not a good idea to graffiti the police car or, you know, knock over the police motorcycle. Like over time, people will start realizing like, hey, spending the night in jail is not uh, awesome. So maybe I should just leave the thing alone. Someone here, are you worried about a recent decline in retail shopping affecting night scope? Concerned, n aware, yes. Concerned, not as much. And I, I'll give you kind of two perspectives. One, I'm very proud of the team. Like we, you know, been surviving, worked through COVID. Uh, and, you know, we did lose uh, a few clients on the retail side of things because obviously, <laughs> you know, they didn't need the, the services because they either shut down or went out of business or whatever it might be. A, a lot of the retail quote unquote stuff is shifted over where? Warehouses, logistics, distribution facilities. So we're kind of seeing maybe a different uh, a clientele. Um, but I, I, I think similarly with schools, like why aren't you all in every single university? I'm like, folks we're still in the middle of a pandemic like we're a lot of folks don't know if they're coming or going don't have budgets sorted out uh, i think the same on the retail side of things it comes and goes um it's also gotten really bad on some retail side of things where we've got new prospective clients that we weren't talking to before because they're seeing their amount of shrink uh, amount of stuff stolen out of their facilities either the patron took it or the employee took it like going through skyrocket numbers, not one, 2% of revenue, not 3%, four, five, six, seven, 8% of revenue, like literally going out the door. Like you're starting to need to think about a different footprint. Which uh, interesting kind of goes into maybe a similar -ish question was uh, what are the impacts of recent inflation on the business? And I mean, I guess you're talking about that and what your clients are seeing and their kind of effect, but I'm um, curious if you can talk about anything else. I, this is more personal uh, gut feel observation than, you know, I've got numbers to, to show you. I think what's ended up happening with the significant amount of labor shortage, and I know this for a fact, it's definitely in the casino vertical the amount of labor shortage and just in general, all the prices going up and our prices staying the same or going down, guess what? The Delta starts looking more and more attractive, right? We can offer a machine for three bucks to nine bucks an hour. Uh, and, you know, we're have already are about to announce instead of, you know, having to sign a contract for 24 seven, you can do single shift, double shift, or triple shift. So a lot of clients, you know, have different budgets or different operating patterns. Hey, I actually need the graveyard shift, uh, one shift, eight hours, you know, Monday through Friday, but on the weekend I need 24 seven, right? We should be accommodating if, you know, we're serious about the, about the mission. And so now you start looking at the numbers going, I get what, you know? Um, and in a lot of cases, they can't fill the positions. So you've got not just the price differential is you got exposure. Uh, so in a weird way, I, I it, it's not a top of mind for me. It's more, more of a, you know, a, a, not a headwind for us. It's not, it's actually likely it's something more positive for us. Um, so here currently, how many robots are awaiting contracts to be signed? As an example, if a large contract were to be signed, how long would it take to deliver? Uh, so obviously we're an, a public company and uh, we don't uh, keep, we don't uh, share that necessary metric uh, on, uh, you know, amount of stuff in the, not in the backlog, but, you know, pending signature. Yeah. Um, I can say that we've typically signed one or two contracts uh, a week and we've been announcing them a along the way, um, which I, I feel pretty confident will continue. If not, you know, increase, uh, things are, are, are looking, uh, up. Um, and you know, we have some folks sometimes critical, like it, why is it only one robot or why is it only two robots? And they, they're missing a couple parts of the equation. 
you need to read the like who signed for it and the potential growth in that like if we sign a, a robot with one or five robots with one massive um i don't know power utility company and we do well do you think they're gonna sit at five like there's potential growth so what we're hopeful that people start understanding is some of these clients that have 500 facilities across the nation or 200 facilities across the nation like we got our foot in the door we need to perform and there's long-term growth potential and oh by the way you know it's not a 99 cent download of an app contract right likely it'll run the five years it's not an immaterial you know you sign one it's as if you sold five teslas and we get criticized and i'm like okay we'll we'll we'll, we'll let the numbers speak for themselves in the coming years and you know it'll, it'll it'll take care of itself but um no i think things things are uh things are looking up on terms of shipping them that that is still a concern we've filed covid you know risk the disclaimers for the last uh, couple of years uh, it's still a problem um, and it's an ever-changing problem. It's most people think it's, oh, you couldn't get the CPU or the GPU or you're missing one transistor or whatever it is. That's not always the case. It's we can't get the resin to make the part. We are are missing this one uh, part that is now out of production, doesn't exist anymore, um, is all kinds of weird stuff and it changes. Um, so right now we're probably in, you know, certainly not in the 30, 60 uh, day mark, which we tried to deliver before. Uh, we're probably in the 90 days um, to, to, to deliver, if not more. And, and it's also highly dependent on which robot, how many and where, and we're, you know, trying to clear through the backlog. So it's, um, we're getting through it is the good news. The bad news is we're quote unquote behind schedule. <laughs> Um, but it's fine because the, you know, backlog ke keeps continuing to grow and, you know, we're still making progress. So, uh, we'll, we'll get through it. Uh, is there any issues with places that still require masks to be worn? Uh, yeah, our, our facial rec can, can see with, with or without a mask is fine. Okay. Hey, that's awesome. That's pretty cool. Uh, okay. Um, has any law enforcement firm made any official comments about Nightscope? Oh, absolutely. Go to nightscope.com slash crime. Um, and we didn't ask them to do this, but the Huntington Park Police Department um, did a before and after. And you can see there pretty clearly that, you know, we kind of cut crime in half uh, for them. And uh, it went so well that the chief of police went to the city council for an extension of the contract uh, and got an additional two years approved on a unanimous vote. Uh, by the city council. Um, and um, the chief has continued to uh, make additional remarks. If you go to our YouTube channel, you could probably see some of the uh, public comments if you like. Can the company comment on where these are being manufactured? They're, they're in, from China and Russia, and we just kind of ship them in and we have surveillance technology. No, just, just, just joking. <laughs> It used to be pre-COVID. We used to have, you know, people come visit when we were allowed to. We can't do this anymore Come uh, because of security and contractual and legal uh, concerns. Um, people come visit and they're like, yeah, so who designed all this stuff? Like, well, we did. Who did all the software, electrical, firmware, mechanical? Who engineered all this stuff? We did. <laughs> Where in China did you get these made? And I just want to like <laughs> come over. So we physically build them ourselves. So we design everything. We engineer it. We physically build the machines in Silicon Valley at Nightscope headquarters. Um, I think there's still a 120 second little quick video on, on YouTube. Uh, just a quick walk around uh, KHQ, as we call it, Nightscope headquarters. Um, and we, we build the machines there. And then we do the end of line test, uh, burn in tests certify them, sh create them up, ship them out, deploy them and support them. Uh, so it's all kind of vertically integrated. We uh, nearly, nearly are close to 100% US content, uh, American made. Have you faced any issues or backlash from those that are worried robots are replacing human jobs? 
So the media talking point is the robots are coming and they're gonna kill everyone and take everyone's job. And that's cute to say it's not reality. Um, so I think I, and we might've covered this before, but just the quick math problem in terms of physical security and law enforcement, it's we, it may not be popular to say, but I'll say it. Uh, there are not enough officers and guards to secure the country properly. There's no opportunity to be reducing headcount. Like that's not a thing. Um, so there are a million guards. There are about a million officers, right? They're running 24 seven. You can't triple shift a human. So if you want to cover a post 24 seven, you need four humans. So take the 2 million people, divide by four. Now you have 500,000 people trying to secure 328 million Americans across 50 states. And you want to know why crime has a $2 trillion negative economic impact on the U.S. every year? Because you only have 500,000 people with the technological equivalent of a number two pencil and a notepad trying to secure a massive country across multiple time zones. Of course, it's not going to work. I mean... So the concept of we're going to go put robots out there and we're going to get rid of the officer and guard when they're not enough for them. So the more positive way to think about it is a million officers, a million guards. If we put a million machines in network, a million autonomous security robots to give the 2 million humans some actual tools for them to cover a lot more ground and do their jobs more effectively, that $2 trillion number better damn well come down. Um, and we, everyone listening to this, you, you know, you have a fundamental right to live, work, and play in a safe community in a safe country. This is what's going on in the news. And it's not okay. Everyone's arguing about, yeah, it's not okay, but where's the solution? Well, go to nightscope.com slash crime and go look at already the positive impact the robots are having instead of talking about we're going to go replace humans, right? Let's, let's be a little bit more, you know, kind of focused and factual. That was a incredible, uh, you know, kind of explanation uh, and the math behind it. So loved it. Um, last question. So last one, we, there's a, there's a Jason, few that you like a lightweight all day. All your, yeah, That's all you got. Crossover. That's all you got. It, and just, just the last one today, you know, wait until oh, okay, weeks okay. to come. Right. You know, I think this all is all right. Hit me. Let's go. Far, let's but, go. Um, here, last one. What does the company do with the decommissioned or broken robots? Broken robots? <laughs> what? Um, so, you know, I built this the world's second largest automotive recycler uh, when I was an executive Ford Motor Company. So, you know, have a, a little bit of experience uh, around that. Um, our business model is machine as a service. It is a subscription. You're not leasing or renting anything. So like if you go to, you know, the Mercedes Benz dealership and go lease that vehicle, it's that VIN number. You're contractually obligated and have a financial interest in that thing, right? That's not what our clients sign up for. They sign up for the software, the hardware, the electrical, the data storage, the telecom, the maintenance, the service, everything's included. There's one throat to choke, which is us. And it's one simple subscription service to the service as opposed to that robot, right? And so what we often do is we do software upgrades every, you know, two to four weeks, new uh, hardware every three, six, nine months. Um, so from time to time, we will outright remove and replace a robot. We will physically go out there and upgrade it. We'll do an over the air update, um, no different than a, a Tesla vehicle. Um, and in some cases when it got to a point where some crazy human decided that they don't know how to drive and, you know, end up smashing into one and okay, well go pull the parts that we are still usable. Like those motors will last for a million miles. Like, why would you not use them again? Right. Um, so we try to be, you know, very careful with our, you know, the monies that our investors have, you know, put us in charge of. And so we try to make sure that we reuse and recycle uh, everything that we can. Um, so the robots come back in a, in, a, in a different form, in a different life to take everyone's jobs and kill everybody. I'm just 
<laughs> well, love it. Well, look, uh, Bill, thanks so much for, for taking the time. Um, I, I know, hey, we, we went through a bunch. Um, you know, I want to thank everyone for, you know, submitting some good questions and also um, encourage people keep those questions coming. We'll do more. of You these said there are going to be dumb questions. Where are the dumb questions, Jason? <laughs> well, I, hey, I just, uh, you know, needed to, uh, I, needed to uh, first, I got right? you. <laughs> false advertising there's no dumb questions so well, look well i appreciate you taking the time like i said and want to say thanks to everyone if you've got questions please drop them below and looking forward to chatting again soon all right good to see you tip of the hat to you